Maria-sama, are you all right? Cannon appeared from behind a thicket after watching Rosa leave. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Maria gave a creepy laugh, but to Cannon, who had seen the whole thing, it looked like she was enduring as best she could. She's a horrible person. I can't believe she's a mother. It can't be helped. You can't expect anything better than that to enter a container of that level. I'm just fine. <laughs> Conan got down on his knees and picked up the trampled candy. It was tragic just looking at it. He thought about dusting it off and returning it to her, but he really couldn't do so with it in that condition. Also, the candy is just fine in this picture. Just as he was wondering what to do, he met Maria's gaze. No, that wasn't quite right. Maria was looking at the candy Kanon had picked up. Right now, Maria's heart was surely the same as the candy that had been trampled into a pulp. Kanon realized this, but he didn't know what he should do. That's right. I'll exchange it for the one I received earlier. Kanon remembered that a similar candy he'd received from Maria was in his pocket. Maria stuck out her hand. Kanan thought she was trying to take it, so he held out the candy, but Maria didn't try to grasp it. Then Kanan realized. She was saying, give it back. No matter how tragic and trampled it was, this candy was Maria's. Her mother had bought it for her. No matter how tragic, it had to be this candy and no other. If only it were intact enough that it could be fixed by dusting it off. Kanan hung his head. Dusting it off is the most I can do. I'm sorry. Cannon held out the miserable looking candy Maria wanted. She took it and spoke. Thank you. A human can't do anything except dust it off, but a witch could restore it to how once it was. It would be easy for Beatrice. <laughs> You know about Beatrice, Sama? Except for Battler, there was no one, no way anyone related to the Ushirimiya family could have failed to know Beatrice's name. But just now, Maria had bragged about Beatrice to Battler. She had spoken almost as though she was meeting with Beatrice regularly. Cannon felt a sharp pain inside his left hand, which was curled into a fist. In the past, a witch called Beatrice had appeared to tempt him and Shannon. He'd always tried to think of it as a bad dream. However, Shannon insisted it was definitely a real witch. And then, this summer, the shrine to the local Shinto god was hit by lightning, disappearing without a trace over the span of a single night. He knew about Shannon breaking that mirror, and he remembered that as the witch departed, she said she'd eventually be revived. And now, this girl, who believed absolutely in Beatrice, spoke as though she'd met Beatrice herself. Hanon couldn't suppress a vague sense of foreboding welling up in his heart. Hello, Maria. We just stared at her for a second there. For a while, Maria remained silent, as though she could see into Hanon's heart. Almost as though she was waiting for a memory of Beatrice to be revived. And then she spoke as though it was a fact. <laughs> you know, I'm friends with Beatrice. I'm even going to meet her today and play. <laughs> You're going to play? Yeah, of course we'll play. We're going to study magic together. <laughs> the face of that witch, whom Canon had tried to pretend was a bad dream, began to slowly creep into the back of his mind. Alright, well, sure that's fine. Father says he's extremely busy with his research. Unfortunately, it seems he'll be unable to come down. 
Come on. We've put this conference in our schedules and come all the way out to Rock and Jima during this crazy busy fall season. You'd think Dad could be at least a bit more sociable. Yeah, seriously. Dr. Nanjo, is it really his research and his mood that are the problem? He isn't already bedridden, unable to get up, right? Well, I wonder. There's not much I can say. Nanjo glanced at Natsui. It seemed he thought it wasn't his place to speak without first getting Natsui's approval. The father's state of health is better than ever. It would be exceedingly rude to call him bedridden. But he only has three months left to live, right? Normally, wouldn't you expect him to be wasted away, unable to get out of bed? Isn't that right, Dr. Nanjo? For a normal patient, that would probably be the case. But Kinzo-san has extraordinary willpower. Perhaps that willpower has frightened even the Reaper away. Well, if he's that energetic, then I guess we'll have little to worry about for the near future, right? Though, if he's got that much spunk, I wish he'd at least come to greet us. Isn't the whole point of this family conference to come and see Dad's face? I'm not even sure why we came now. <laughs> Don't say that. If he were here, you'd complain the whole time about being unable to relax. Shouldn't we celebrate the fact that all of us siblings have gathered this year to spend some time alone? Unlike Kraus to not start a sentence with oh ho. We didn't get to see him at last year's family conference either, right? Can't you understand why his blood children might want to see him after two years? If there's anything you'd like to say in greeting, I will tell him for you. Or, Eva-san, is there something you'd like to discuss with Father beyond merely greeting him? Mm. Come on, what are you talking about? Sheesh. Give it a rest, Ava. Not so, son, forgive us. Ava's just worried about Father's condition as his daughter. Please try and understand how she feels. <laughs> Poor put upon Hideyoshi. Indeed. Look how quickly you've grown to respect Father now that you know how much longer he has to live. Yes, I believe I do understand why you want to see him so much. <laughs> What are you trying to say? Quit it, Aniki. Why don't we pray that his mood will improve by dinner? Anyway, we've only just arrived. For now, we're only here for a casual greeting. And we could even hold the family conference without Dad. In fact, there's a few things we siblings shouldn't bring to him until we've formed a unified opinion. Isn't that right, Hideyoshi Nissan? Yep. Just as Rudolf Kuhn says, this is the only time a year we can all meet in person. We gotta take this valuable time seriously and be frank with each other. Oh, this is this is interesting. This is the conversation last time, but Rosa's not here. It's so funny how different it is without Rosa here. Because everybody's like, everybody can't end their sentences with, Isn't that right, Rosa? <laughs> Even though the tea hadn't arrived yet, they were very determined. But before that, perhaps we can spare the time to enjoy some black tea at our leisure, surrounded by the wonderful furnishings of the parlor. Curie's words seemed to contain a subtle admonishment directed at everyone gathered there. They all understood, and as they cleared their throats and straightened their neckties, the atmosphere in the room returned to normal for a time. Lily, that's got a lot of, like, lesbian? I thought you were American. Energy. Excuse me. I've brought some tea. Hey, Shannon-chan. You just keep getting prettier and prettier. Shannon entered the parlor, pushing the serving cart. Everyone decided to relax and enjoy some black tea for the time being. A wonderful aroma began to spread throughout the room. As far as anyone could see, the strained atmosphere from before Shannon's arrival seemed like a lie. Of course, Shannon, who was setting out the tea, probably didn't even notice. Kyrie seemed to laugh faintly at how adult everyone was suddenly acting. 
Yeah, this is just <laughs> Team Ushiromiya. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> KOF moment. <laughs> Rudolph didn't like it when Kyrie took the initiative and spoke at the family conference. Why not, Rudolph? She's so good at it, clearly. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> There's our answer. It was his worthless male pride. <laughs> He probably didn't want to look like a weak man who took advice from his wife. She understood that and did her best to refrain from saying any more than was necessary. <laughs> Sometimes Ryukichi is like, gender! And you do- you figure out the, what I'm trying to say about the gender. And then sometimes he's like, it was his worthless male pride! <laughs> So she separated herself from the circle of siblings, who only super superficially appeared to be enjoying some time together alone, and casually drank her tea near the window. Oh, Rosa-san. I thought you siblings were enjoying some alone time. <laughs> you must be joking. Sorry, don't take it the wrong way. I'm just a little exasperated by my husband. Apparently, Rosa hadn't been able to keep up with that on-the-surface friendliness. They'd come here to fight bloodily and dirtily, each trying to grab a part of the inheritance for themselves. She probably didn't like suddenly pretending that they were all chummy. Or maybe she was still too immature for that. It looks like the wind started blowing hard out there. The plants are all shaking so much. The typhoon's probably gotten pretty close already. I wonder if we'll see a lot of rain tonight. Marian-chan really has grown a lot this past year. Does it look that way? She still can't even fold her own clothing yet. No, it's true. It's because she has such an affectionate mother. She'll grow into a girl with a rich heart. Rosa, are you going to remember that... Okay. Rosa fell silent. Maybe she was unsure as to what Kyrie meant by that. I'm... a failure as a mother. Children don't get to choose their parents. That poor girl. Doesn't that go both ways? A parent can't choose what kind of child they have either. Rosa bit her lower lip. This isn't a matter of assigning blame. Isn't it enough that you take your time and watch over her as she grows, conscious of the fact that you'll be living together? You spend every day with Maria chan so you probably don't notice the small changes. But the rest of us, who haven't seen her for a year, can see clearly how much she's grown. If you really mean that, thank you very much. Then, if you will excuse me, if there's anything you desire, please call for it at any time. Shannon bowed politely and left the room. As Hideyoshi and Rudolph, who had a soft spot for women, watched her go, the atmosphere in the room began to revert back to what it had been right before Shannon's visit. If father can't come down, well, that does still leave us with certain things we can discuss. Right, Rudolph? Yep, that's right. We didn't come all the way out here just to drink some dusty tea, right? Don't talk about the black tea that way. Very well. What is that matter that you're so clearly eager to discuss? My, my. Those people really are determined. They certainly got started quick. I need to join in, too. If I don't assert myself, those people will quickly forget that there are four siblings. Sounds like you've got it pretty tough yourself. Maybe I spoke too harshly. Forgive me. No, I don't mind. I'm the one who should be apologizing. As a pair of mothers with daughters, we should talk more often. Every single time we meet, we end up talking about something shady. You can blame the atmosphere in this mansion for that. Once you breathe in the air, everyone gets so strained. Just once, I'd like to have a l nice long cup of tea with you when we aren't attending a family conference. There's a wonderful coffee shop in Ginza that's a favorite of mine. 
please let me invite you sometime soon. Thank you, Kirie-san. That sounds great. Was she asking her on a date? <laughs> oh, no. The sky's gotten dark pretty fast. I could almost believe the people in this room made the weather worse. There's already thunder. Oh. Was that one there? Huh? There really were small splashes of rain on the glass of the parlor window. The weather seemed to have worsened faster than expected. Just then, a silence thunderbolt struck inside Rose's head, and she remembered that her beloved child was out in the Rose Garden. Oh yeah, Kyrie and, Kyrie and Rudolph have, um, uh, Angie. She was mentioned in book one in one line. <laughs> she's sick, that's why she's not here. A normal girl would try to go inside if the weather got bad, but Maria was different. She would sometimes get stubborn and refuse to move if rain or even spears fell from the sky. That's right, I told that child to just stay there doing that forever, didn't I? But, oh no! Maria! Everyone looked back at Rosa when she let out a small scream. What? What is it? I I'm sorry, I'm going outside for a second. I'll be right back. What the- Seriously, what's going on with her? I'm sorry, I, I love this Rudolph sprite so much. Why is he doing the like, whoa, blank be upon ye thing? Don't worry, she'll be back soon. More importantly, shouldn't we begin our main topic? <laughs> He's like handsome skin. <laughs> oh, I think I look like Giga Chad. That's right. We can keep talking about that without Rosa. Let's return to our discussion. Rosa dashed from the entrance hall into the Rose Garden. When she opened the door, the wind that hit her was too strong to be called a light breeze, and told her that the typhoon was approaching faster than she thought. Just as Kyrie had said, the wind was mixed in with small droplets of rain. There was also a low rumble of thunder. It could start raining any time. Rosa headed for the Rose Garden. She headed for the place where she had scolded Maria a short while ago. It was almost lunchtime. The children had been told to come inside the mansion around lunchtime, so they were probably in the guest house waiting to be called. Even if Maria didn't come to them, they would surely think I took her to the mansion with me and wouldn't worry much. After all, she had been with her mother, so there should have been no reason to worry. I was here, and I abandoned my daughter to the worsening weather. Maria! Are you there? If you're there, answer me! Ugh. I was right. She was still standing stock still, exactly the same way she had been in the place where I had scolded her. Held in her hand was the candy that I had bought given her, and then stepped on and crushed. With that gripped in her hand, she stood there as the powerful winds whipped her hair about, tormenting her. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry, Maria. Forgive Mama. Ugh. Mama, welcome back. I waited for a long time for you to come back. The scary witch pinched me, but I stayed strong, waiting for Mama to come back without crying. Maria, forgive your Mama. Forgive your Mama. You didn't do anything wrong. You were just possessed by a bad witch again. So I'm fine. I really like you, Mama. I love you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive your mama. For losing to the bad witch. Rosa buried her face in Maria's small chest, crying and begging forgiveness. And once again, those tears dripped down after who knows how many times. If only the brilliant sun had been shining on the two of them, all of their cares would have evaporated, and it might have felt like they could begin anew. 
However, what surrounded the two of them was worsening weather. Sadly, there were only fierce winds with occasional thunder. The sound of Maria sniffling brought Rosa back to her senses. If Maria stood exposed to the wind for too long, she'd probably catch a cold. Okay, Maria. It's almost time for lunch. Why don't you come back to the mansion with me? Ugh. Won't go. W why not? Rosa thought she'd already received Maria's forgiveness, so she hadn't imagined Maria would refuse. But that expression on Maria's face didn't look like that of a child resisting her mother, so Rosa couldn't understand why Maria wanted to stand still, pointlessly, as the weather grew even worse. Maria answered that question. It's Beatrice. She'll be here really soon. So I'm waiting. Maria. Rosa struggled to find words for a moment, then fell silent. They'd only just managed to make up after all. She chose her words carefully, trying to get Maria to come with her to the mansion without denying the witch outright. Beatrice is... coming? Ugh. Really? Then instead of waiting here, why don't we wait in the mansion? If you stay in this wind too long, you'll catch a cold. She'll come. Beatrice will come. And when she does, I'll give her candy. I'll do trick-or-treat. I'll give her a jack-o'-lantern marshmallow candy and say, Happy Halloween! I was tempted to do the Toby Fox English voice, but I, I think it's too jarring. Ugh. Mario pulled out yet another sweet out of her handbag, moaning, Ugh. Rosa was bewildered and didn't know what to do as Mario started being difficult again. At that time, there was a sudden blast of thunder. It was probably a sign. A sign that this island had been sealed off by the storm, detached from common sense and reality. So, after this moment, all common sense would probably cease to apply. The wind blew even stronger, and amidst that blizzard of scattered rose petals, a figure appeared, leaving Rosa unable to imagine that this was a scene from reality. It was probably, no, definitely, fantastical. After all, that shadow of a person was... Hi, Beatrice. Beatrice! Oh, Beat Beatrice's suit? Yeah, that's what she's wearing in the, the second painting. Different outfit. different outfit, a little bit of golden smear playing. Maria dashed over to the shadow. Normally, Rosa would scold her daughter if she dashed over to someone whom she hadn't seen before and didn't know. But Rosa forgot to do that, was unable to do anything but stand there, stunned. It's been quite some time. Have you been well? Ooh, I've been well. Witches don't catch colds. Ooh. <laughs> Indeed, a witch can use curses to make people catch colds, but how foolish would it be if she caught one herself? From now on, you should take care not to catch something like a cold yourself. She patted Maria's head as she said this, smiling roguishly. Rosa couldn't have known the name of the woman who was happily spoiling Maria. However, Maria had called it out in the beginning when the woman appeared. So, even though Rosa had never met her, even though the woman still hadn't introduced herself, Rosa was able to know her name. However, that name held a special meaning on Rock and Jima and in the Ushiramiya family. There's no way something that stupid could be- Beatrice! Happy Halloween! Look at what we bought! I'll give you one too, Beatrice! Ooh! Indeed! Happy Halloween! Oh, is this for me? How truly adorable that a candy would be made out of this. The lonely light of a man lost in the darkness of purgatory, unable to go to heaven or hell. Right now, 
on this island that has been cut off from both the world of humans and the world of non-humans, there may be no more suitable suite. <laughs> hmm. Maria, what's wrong with this one? The witch noticed the sweet Maria was grasping. It was Maria's candy, which had been stomped on by Rosa until it reached this pitiful state. Ugh. Got stepped on and smashed. Can you fix it, Beto? <clears throat> there we go, our first canon Beto. Maria didn't go so far as to say it was her mother who'd stepped on it. However, for some reason, when the witch saw that candy, she looked at Rosa and grinned. A chill went down Rosa's spine, as though this gaze was staring straight through her. It shall be easy. Give it to me. Ugh. Maria held the candy out gleefully. Rosa could do nothing but watch, stunned. Rosa's like, what the fuck is happening right now? How did this person plan to trick Maria, somehow undoing the fact that the candy had been pitifully trampled? Maria looked as though she believed it could be fixed good as new. Without real magic, there was no way such a thing could be possible. My, my, it is quite crushed, isn't it? Come, Maria. Close your eyes and try to remember. Because it really was that wonderful a candy. The candy of your memories is always full and fluffy. So you try to remember as well. What kind of candy was it really? Along with those strange words spoken as though singing an improvised folk song, the witch threw the sweet into the air. Maria was closing her eyes and remembering just as the witch had told her to. What shape had that crushed candy really had? Therefore, only Rosa saw that scene. The sweet that had been thrown into the air burst into a gold color. No, that wasn't it. Those were golden butterflies. Scattered into several golden butterflies. And they began to gather at the witch's hand, which was held up to the sky. And as she did this, unbelievably, it returned to its beautiful original form, no different from when it had been bought. Only Rosa and the witch witnessed that scene. Unable to comprehend what was occurring right before her eyes, Rosa stood with her mouth hanging open, completely forgetting to shut it. You may now open your eyes. Take it. With this, your sweet has returned to normal. Ooh, the interest is always incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Live Rosa reaction. There was a stark contrast between Rosa's shock and Maria's innocent joy. Was that what the witch was laughing at? A smile floated to Beatrice's face, one different from the smile she'd shown Maria. Does my face seem familiar? If you stare so fixedly, you might burn a hole through it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Those words triggered something very clearly in Rosa's mind. Rosa knew this face. She knew it from the portrait of the witch. But... No, wait. Could this mystery woman really be... Maria, I give you this in exchange for the sweet you gave me. Ooh? A letter? The witch pulled a western envelope from her pocket and gave it to Maria. However, when Maria made to open it, the witch stopped her. You must not. The time will soon come for you to open it, but until then, you absolutely must not. Take good care of it. That will be your invitation to the Golden Land. The Golden Land. So you'll finally take me there. <laughs> take it and treat it with care. You must not show it to anyone. Ooh, I'll keep that promise. You've always got to keep promises with witches. And this is for you. Huh? M me? She probably hadn't imagined that the witch would speak to her, too. 
Oh wait, did Rosa see her in chapter one? No, nobody saw her except uh, at the very end when Maria saw her. And like, Battler maybe kind of saw her, but it was like not super clear. Rosa was bewildered by the second western envelope which was thrust before her. She'd seen this type of envelope before. There could be no mistake. This was one of Kinza's special envelopes, used when he wrote with his own hand and bearing the Ushiramiya family crest. It was sealed with red sealing wax, and furthermore, it had a mark that seemed to have been made by the head's ring. In other words, even without asking what was inside this letter, Rosa knew that this woman, whom Maria called Beatrice, was trusted enough to be placed in charge of a personal letter of the current Ushiramiya head. Rosa and Beto look extremely similar. They do look pretty similar, don't they? It could have been any of the four siblings. However, the fact that I have met you here probably means that you were chosen by Kinzo's roulette. So take it. Then read its contents aloud while seated at the dinner table when all of the siblings are gathered. What did you say? Rosa looked back and forth several times between the witch's face and the envelope that had been handed to her. Today was the family conference, and the biggest object of discussion would be the inheritance problem. So she had joined together with Ava and Rudolph, and they planned to force a certain condition on Kraus to try and extort several hundred million yen in cash out of him. It was as if the witch could see through all of that. What does she intend to announce when all of us siblings are gathered? And with a personal envelope that no one but the Ushiramiya head can use. Maria, the weather is getting worse. Return to the guest house and wait for lunchtime. And Rosa, we will meet again later. Allow me to introduce myself again at that time. <laughs> the witch turned her back to her, laughing. Then she began to head towards the mansion with an air of composure. Maria energetically called out and watched her go, then began to dash towards the guest house, leaving Rosa behind. As though she wanted to inform the other cousins of her fortunate meeting with the witch as soon as she could. At last, Rosa was left alone in the rose garden as the winds grew stronger, unable to do anything but pray that what had happened was just a daydream. Yeah, that's, um, I was pretty excited for y'all to see fucking that. Fucking Beatrice showing up in a suit in the garden. <laughs> when the witch reached the entrance hall, Genji could be seen there. Genji welcomed the guest approaching from the entrance hall with a respectful bow. I have been waiting, Beatrice-sama. It's been quite some time, Genji. <laughs> You've gotten old. No matter how old it becomes, furniture still carries out its work like furniture until the end. I remember how that man's wife used to be jealous of you. Is Kinzo doing well? <laughs> I forgot about the fucking... The line claiming that Kinzo's wife used to be jealous of Genji. That's wild. He is doing extremely well. <laughs> the witch probably laughed because she knew Kinzo's own doctor had announced that Kinzo didn't have long to live. However, if anyone actually looked at Kinzo and noticed his vigor, which wasn't at all what you'd expect from someone nearing the end of his life, they might easily call that doing extremely well. Maybe that's what the witch was laughing at. Then let us go and greet him. I look forward to hurling curses at each other after thirty years. As the witch grinned, she started le walking, leaving the Genji behind. Her gait was like that of a family member who knew the inside of the mansion well. That's a hell of a line, isn't it? Genji followed her in the manner of one who served her.
At that time, Kyrie came out of the parlor. She'd probably gone out to fix her makeup or something. And when she saw Genji following a witch, she was surprised, although her expression did not change. Kyrie having a real, is that the golden witch moment? <laughs> a guest for Kinzo had arrived, despite him being almost dead, on the day of the family conference when the fate of the inheritance was to be decided. And furthermore, this person was familiar enough with the Ushirimiya family household that Genji was following behind her. Kyrie immediately realized that this person she had never met before was deeply important. Kyrie and the witch's eyes met. Realizing that it would be rude to pretend not to notice, she greeted the witch. It's a pleasure to meet you. You were Rudolph's second wife, yes? Correct. This is Kyrie-san, Rudolph-sama's current wife. From this exchange, Kyrie realized that this was a guest of a fairly high rank, even amidst the Ushirimiya family. And the fact that this was a guest on that level, coupled with her resemblance to the portrait in the entrance hall, made Kyrie's eyes instantly open wide. Tell hello, Bito. Oh fuck, I forgot about that! Upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. <laughs> oh, listen to Fishy Aroma go crazy. This is a good track. <laughs> level 100 Mafia, level 100 Golden Witch. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. I'm Kyrie. I wonder if this is our first meeting. If we have met before, I apologize for forgetting your name. So, you intend to force me to state my name, even though you already have a vague idea of the answer? Kyrie thought she'd given a sociable and humble greeting. Her expression grew slightly cloudy at that openly oppressive response. At any rate, this didn't seem to be a person she could grow to like. But if Kyrie's guesses were correct, this witch probably held a vital key to what her own husband was most interested in. Something that couldn't help but influence tonight's family conference. So without shooting back a retort, Kyrie silently watched her go up the stairs to the second floor, with Genji following behind. So, when someone tapped her shoulder from behind, she was so surprised she almost choked. It was... Natsui. Kyrie-san, why are you standing still in a place like this? Are you not feeling well? Uh, I'm sorry. I was just fascinated by the portrait of the witch for a bit. Oh, you mean the golden witch Beatrice. The one whose gold was supposedly necessary for the revived Ushirimiya family we see today. Quite a fantastical story, just what one might expect from father. Natsui spoke in a perfectly ordinary way. It was the sort of comment you'd expect from someone convinced that the thought of a witch existing was ridiculous, no more than another of Kinzo's ramblings. However, for some reason, that point of view didn't seem quite right to Kyrie now. Just a moment herself, she herself had seen... Just, what? What? What did I... Hold on. Just a moment ago, she herself had seen the Golden Witch come in from the entrance hall and climb up the stairs. So, Natsui's words made it feel as though someone was trying to deny the existence of that person, or else make it seem like she was never there to begin with. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm getting a bit of a headache. I think I'll rest for a little while. Oh, is that so? Then I have some good headache medicine. I'll get it for you. <laughs> when somebody gets a headache, is Natsui just like, Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I have something for this. This is like, this is like my specialty. Headaches are my special interest. I get them all the time. I love headaches. Natsui is the hookup. We are referring to headache medicine. 
The hallway in front of Kinza's study was filled with the scent of sweet poison, Percu peculiar to that green liquor. Genji, who was completely used to it, did not grimace. And the Golden Witch didn't grimace either. How long has he been in there since he last left? I believe it has already been several years. Is he that desperate to turn me into a bird in a cage? How pitiful. By now, you're the bird in a cage. You're the ghost of this study, are you not? How pitiful that he is unable to recognize even that. Until he meets you again, he will probably continue his research, even after literally becoming a ghost. Is it love, or madness, or a delusion? And yet, perhaps even those can form magical power when strong enough. You sad magician. The witch grasped the doorknob to the study. When she did, there was the sound like that of flesh burning and splitting open. It was the sound of the doorknob literally burning the witch's hand. Beatrice summoned. What is this? A ward against magic? Is that person unable to get by without relying on something like this? Thank you for the hydrate spade. I have heard that this door would cause you great pain, Beatrice Sama. Shall I open it? No, it is fine. If he wins, I will be a bird in a cage for all eternity. If he loses, only the life of a laughing stock will be left. The life of a pitiful magician who went mad with love and lost everything. Already, Kinzo and I, and even I, are nothing more than pieces laid out on the game board. All that is left is for the roulette to decide who wins and who loses. Until the roulette shows its result, there is no need for me and Kinzo to meet again. Does Peace Beatrice not remember Chapter 1? It seems like she might not. The witch looked at her hand, which was beginning to heal bit by bit, even though it had been horribly burned. Or perhaps that is why he has this ward here in the first place. <laughs> yes, perhaps even that is honorable in its own way. By now, everything sits on top of Kinzo's game board. I like it, Kinzo. Allow me to enjoy my game with you. Allow me to enjoy the failure of this final gamble. Of the old magician who fell in love with me and threw away his entire life. And Beatrice is so fucking cool. I love that character so much. <laughs> it's one o'clock. She really had the erm what the scallop face when she got burned. True. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't have new tips. Ah, we do have new tips. Okay, everybody else's looks like it's the same, but Beatrice is different. The mysterious visitor and 19th person who... <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the fit is unbelievable. It actually goes so hard. It's crazy. The mysterious visitor and 19th person who appeared on the day of the family conference. She goes by the same name as the Golden Witch who gave the gold to Kinzo. Her reasons for visiting are unknown. She was ushered into the VIP room, which no one has been allowed to use in the past. Yeah, this this outfit goes crazy. It's like it's the the the, the beta suit is so good. All right, we'll keep going. I don't know who this is. Who is it? Excuse me, I have brought lunch. Enter. Excuse me. I 
After receiving approval, Canon entered the VIP room, pushing the serving cart that carried lunch. The servants called this room the Witch's VIP room. That was because Kinzo strictly ordered that it always be kept clean so that it could be used at any time. Even so, guests would not be allowed in this room no matter who they were. That must be just unbelievably infuriating. You're, you're a servant at this mansion, and there's just a room that you always have to keep clean that no one uses. That's why, at some point, the servants had started calling it the VIP room, which was supposed to be set aside only to welcome the special person Kinzo waited for, the witch from that portrait. And today, Kanon realized that this was absolutely true. When he entered the room, the blonde-haired witch was gazing out the window. Outside, the rain was no longer falling weakly. As she looked out on the beautiful rose garden, which had been tended to for over several days for today's sake. As she saw the winds and rain ravage it, was she struck by some sentimental feelings? Helen was not able to tell anything more from her back, which faced him. I will prepare the meal, Beatrice saw. Helen went out of his way to call out the witch's name, hoping that she'd turn around. He wanted to know. He wanted to know if the witch who tempted him and Shannon in the past had really appeared again. When he did, the witch whose name had been called laughed, her back still facing him. Holding back her voice, she laughed. Cannon was startled. It was almost as though she had read his mind and knew he had called out to her, hoping to make her turn around. It smells good. It appears Krauss hired a good cook. Yes, he is called Goda and was employed here very recently. <laughs> there is nothing better than being skilled at cooking. Delicious food completes the three pillars of pleasure for living in the human world. It is the secret to preventing boredom after a thousand years. <laughs> Conan and the witch's eyes met. Beato talks about food a lot, it's interesting. Then she grinned. Without a doubt, certainly, this was clearly the witch from that day, Beatrice. The witch that no one but he and Shannon could see in the past finally held a form, and had openly as a guest and had arrived openly as a guest through the entrance hall. Beatrice, Summer. It has been a long time, Canon. The furniture. <laughs> it has been quite some time. Conan tried to remember to be polite to this guest for the time being, but the visit of this suspicious witch made dark clouds start to enshroud his heart, especially considering that today was the family conference. You appear to be uneasy about what I plan to do now that I have appeared. Am I right? Canon loud sweating. Canon didn't force an answer. This witch probably reads minds, so it's pointless to go to the trouble of saying it out loud. Of course, she could read even his inner resistance. So the witch giggled at Canon's childish defiance. I came to fulfill my promise with Kinza. Your final promise with the master? I lent Kinza a mountain of gold. When Kinzo gives that up, it will be returned to me with interest. I came to accept that interest tonight. I don't know what you're talking about. However, uncertainty began to gather in his heart. Whatever this witch had to say, it couldn't be anything good. <laughs> There's no mistake. Whenever witches have something to say, it's never anything good. You are correct. However, like scissors, the potential of witches depends entirely on how they are used. Sometimes there are those like King Solomon who succeed in great exploits. However, most who make use of us end up meeting a cruel fate, just like in fairy tales. <laughs> but Kinzo is crafty. He has incorporated even my collection of the interest into his ceremony. 
Is he an absurdly powerful magician who can surpass even me? Or else a mere fool possessed by madness? Amusing. Truly amusing. Kanan couldn't guess what the witch was muttering and laughing about. All he knew was that anything that made this witch laugh must have the exact opposite meaning for everyone else. And in the back of his mind, the horrifying words the witch had spat at him in the past began to resurface. What? Did you think I'd lend you my power and ask for nothing in exchange? I'll gladly assist a pair in love, and in exchange I'll enjoy watching the cruel fate they'll eventually meet. I have never come across a better show, not over the course of a thousand years. Yeah, she truly does. She's rocking... What is this? What is this theme? This is... This is organ short, six million in C minor. It's good. Could it be that you... <laughs> Behold the sweet fish river running through my beloved hometown. You who seek the golden land follow its path downstream in search of the key. The witch suddenly began to recite a bizarre poem. It was something he remembered hearing. Could it be the witch's epitaph? There was no mistake. It was the epitaph that accompanied the portrait of the witch Kinzo had put on display. The relatives had guessed that it referred to the location of the hidden gold, but no one knew what it meant for sure. The witch suddenly began reciting that epitaph. Ken, since you are furniture, I imagine you've heard about it from Kinza. The day when everything will be returned to the Golden Land has come. Rejoice! The day when you will be freed from the shame of living as furniture has finally arrived. I believe you've wanted that for a long time. To furniture, which finds no value in its own existence, merely existing day to day must be nothing but agony. To those with souls, this world is worth clinging to. But those without souls find this world to be nothing but suffering. <laughs> Complicated expressions flitted across Kanon's face. This was the day of release that Kanon had been looking forward to. However, the coming of this day had been mercilessly sudden. And for some reason, he didn't like the hateful tone used by this witch as she informed him of the coming of this long-awaited day of rest. Kanan couldn't even decide what emotion he should be feeling. Why do you not rejoice? Could you actually have some regrets left in the real world? As mere furniture? I have no regrets, because I am furniture. <laughs> you truly are a model specimen of furniture. How nice, how nice. However, it won't be any fun if you have no regrets at all. Are you saying that regrets are how you find pleasure? That is correct. Most witches who live for a thousand years get tired of life. In order to escape boredom, I adore people's fates with fruit and brandy and cook them like cakes. I find humans dancing through oppressive fates inside an oven to be so very entertaining. <laughs> you see, I'm actually a tad famous in this regard. So much that rare guests come from far away to see my skill at cooking. <laughs> Perhaps this is something that mere furniture cannot understand. Oh, interesting. She refers to what she does to human beings as cooking. That makes it make a little more sense, the whole food thing. Kalnon couldn't understand what the witch was saying. However, he fully realized that this was a terrifying being who treated the, treated the fate of humans as a show 
She's actually cooking. Let her cook. Enjoying it whenever some harm befell them. However, furniture has no soul or life, much less a fate. Pitiful furniture does nothing but serve until the day they're released from the real world. To furniture like that, the witch, who had come to release them from everything, was a being to be received with overflowing affection. Even though the day Kanan should have been waiting impatiently for had come, he was confused by his own inability to accept it easily. Why was it? The face of Shannon, the person he loved as a sister, rose to his mind. And for some reason, Jessica's face did too. <sighs> Kanan bit his lower lip hard enough that it hurt. Thinking about Jessica like that was something furniture must never do. Even though he thought he'd known that, even though he'd complained about Shannon's relationship, why was it that Jessica rose into his mind at a time like this? He felt a little shameful at his own naivete. And to forget about Jessica, he turned his thoughts to Shannon. Shannon is also furniture. She has no reason not to rejoice at the coming of the day when all will, all will return to nothingness. But Shannon, through her relationship with George, has experienced an emotion forbidden to furniture. Even though she isn't qualified to be bonded with him, she's still trapped in a dream that she isn't allowed to have. Will Shannon be able to joyfully accept this development? No, she won't. Shannon still has lingering regrets. Those will probably become a great source of pain and torture for her. And those lingering regrets were planted by none other than this witch. Why? Because that would be more interesting, nothing more. This day, that Shannon should have been waiting impatiently for, will probably be a harsh burden for her, giving her emotions that she must never experience. I thank you for granting me, us furniture, the day of our release. And I hate you for making this day so difficult for Shannon to accept. I wanted to make you suffer from your regrets as well, just like Shannon. However, you continue to live like furniture with foolish honesty, never getting ensnared by me. And yet, it seems you loved Shannon a little too dearly, right? <laughs> Shannon's regrets are now your regrets. Will those feelings transform into hatred for me? If you wish to kill me, give it a try. <laughs> As Kinzo's furniture, you should have at least that much power, right? However, if you kill me, then the day of rest for furniture will not come for all eternity. Could you bear to live with that? Are you truly capable of resisting when I try to release you? <laughs> Neil! What? Kneel and kiss my shoes. Otherwise, I will leave this place. I'll go back and never show myself again for all eternity. So, Kana, do you think you could bear to live like that? <sighs> if the door to the Golden Land is open, your hard life as furniture will end. If you desire, I can even give you life as a human. After that, you will be on the same level as Jessica. Surely you want to experience the taste of love. <laughs> There's no point in trying to hide it. After seeing Shannon indulging in the sweet sea of love, you grew jealous. You are sorely tempted to know the taste of love. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Are you trying to ensnare me again? I won't be reduced to a toy for your amusement. <laughs> then I will be satisfied with Shannon alone. After all, you aren't the only one who was implanted with a seed. Even fruiting plants sometimes fail to bear fruit, after all. The one who obtains the key must then travel to the Golden Land in accordance with these rules. On the first twilight, offer the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. 
On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two who are close. The witch recited the epitaph again. It was so sudden and diverged so strongly from the current topic. However, that challenging smile made it seem almost as though she was using that epitaph as a threat against canon. Do you not understand? For the ceremony of the epitaph to succeed, at the second twilight, two who are close must be offered as sacrifices. It could be any two who are close. A husband and wife, or even a pair of lovers. According to the rules of the ceremony, who will be selected is up to me to decide on a whim. Don't you think there could be no more fitting sacrifice for the second twilight than Shannon as she is now? <laughs> you dirty... Conan realized something. Until today he thought he'd given up everything else and lived as furniture, acting like furniture. But in reality, that wasn't true. He loved Shannon too dearly. Therefore, when Shannon was in pain, Kanon shared in that. If only Shannon had continued to live as furniture, indifferent like Kanon, without any regrets in this world, he wouldn't have had to be in so much pain. The witch planned a show with the the bat. What was that? That's a bad one. The witch planned to toy with Shannon, who had known the taste of love. No, whom she had taught the taste of love, as she killed her. She wouldn't be welcomed into the Golden Land and granted a compassionate release. Instead, if the witch had her way, she'd be used as a sacrifice, subjected to the utmost of torture and pain, and forcibly turned into a human foundation for this evil ceremony. And this witch would probably make Shannon meet this horrible fate, for no reason other than it was amusing to her. Furthermore, she was threatening to do this so that she could make Conan, who had never submitted to the witch, finally give in. It was that simple. In the end, though he had tried to resist the witch and avoid pleasing her, he had only made things more amusing for her. After all, he was furniture. No, a toy. They were nothing but toys, meant only to distract from her boredom. Damn. What will you do, Kanon? If you kneel, I might refrain from choosing Shannon as a sacrifice, see? <laughs> I've always wanted to make a toy like you surrender someday. <laughs> Without even a fragment of elegance, the witch sneered at Kanon and laughed indecently. Yeah, she's great. I love how the text says that her laugh has no elegance and is indecent. <laughs> I'm trying to give her the most distasteful laugh I can. That's right. He'd predicted Canon's submission even before he'd made that decision himself. <sighs> Conan chose to get down on both knees in front of the witch. It didn't matter what happened to himself. However, the one thing he couldn't bear to see was Shannon, who had given him his only reason to live during his days as furniture, being toyed with like this. That was why kissing the shoes of the witch was an easy oath for Kanon to make. When his quivering lips actually touched the witch's shoe, Beatrice let a look of ecstasy rise to her face, then laughed with a voice filled to bursting. At that moment, the witch, who had born, grown bored of life after a thousand years, was completely filled with the evil emotion that she lived for. <laughs> Beto was just like, I love this shit so much. This is why, this is why I get up in the morning. I live for this shit. When lunch ended, the relatives moved to the parlor. Rosa had bought a high-class brand of black tea from a famous store in Ginza. That had been served, and the parlor was filled with a pleasant aroma. Since the children were there, too, the adults tried to interact like normal relatives on the surface, talking peacefully about recent events and how the children were growing up. 
It had started raining, so the children couldn't do anything but sit here like this, watching TV, unable to go outside. Maria was apparently a TV kid, and she kept watching a boring daytime program without getting bored, giggling all by herself. At first, Batway joined in, seeming to deepen his relationship with Maria. But he had gotten up early that morning and was gradually hit by a wave of drowsiness. I like the way they just sort of narrate and skip over stuff that we saw in book one. <sighs> oh, that's a big yawn. Did you get up really early this morning? Well, something like that. Now that all the tension's gone, I've started getting sleepy while listening to the sound of the rain. Tension? <laughs> you call freaking out like that tension? At least it is for me. Oh. Battler gave another great yawn and slowly laid down on the sofa. I thought Bro like tripped. He really did look tired. George and the others had tried talking to him, thinking it was a sign of boredom, but when they realized he really was sleepy, they decided to let him be. My, my. They say that if you lay down right after eating, it'll become a mackerel. <laughs> What the fuck is Kumasawa ever talking about? Stop kidding around. Goda-san said we'd be having calf steak tonight. That'd make it mackerel steak. Kumasawa-san, he looks pretty tired. Could you get him a blanket? That's true, she is talking about mackerel. That is kind of what she does. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, thank you for the posture check and the hydrate. Kumasawa brought a blanket from, over from the shelf. The large parlor wasn't cold, but the air had gotten a little chilly. So when Battler took the blanket, he immediately wrapped himself up in it like a turtle. You really were sleepy. Well, when would you like to wake up? I'll wake you. Nah, can't say I've got any particular requests. You can wake me up if you need something from me. And if you don't, just let me sleep forever. Night. I want a battler blanket spray. Uh, battler sleeping? A nap? A nap? Uh, I'll do it too. Hey, Maria. Battler's sleepy, so you gotta leave him alone. Kumasawa-san, could you give us another blanket? It was doubtful whether Maria really wanted to take a nap. She probably saw Battler wrapped up in a blanket and wanted to do the same. Blanky mode battler. It's perfect. <laughs> when she received the blanket from Kumasawa, she joyfully wrapped herself up in it and set camp again in front of the TV. Sheesh. And just when we'd finally gathered all the cousins together after six years. This guy doesn't have a clue that he's the main guest of this family conference, does he? I can still hear you. We took it easy eating lunch, and there's even a typhoon and rain outside. Since I've got nothing to do, that means it isn't my turn yet. I wonder about that. If you have a passive attitude like that, and never do anything unless something else happens, your life will be pretty boring, right? No, that's not what I mean. How should I put it? At times like this, I like to think about it this way. It isn't my turn. If this were a play, it wouldn't be my turn to go on stage. So, the best thing to do is stay on the wings of the stage. You're always the main character of your own life, right? Why are you acting like you're in a supporting role? You've got to move forward by yourself and get up on the stage. Ballard deadass, like, I'm not the main character right now, which is fine, I'll take a nap. <laughs> That's not what I mean. I'm trying to say it's not my turn yet. <sighs> Sorry, I'm sleepy and my mind's a mess. Give me a break. <laughs> no kidding. You're so sleepy you're spouting nonsense. Although there is another way to interpret that it isn't Battler's turn yet. Obviously. <laughs> no kidding. You're so sleepy you're spouting nonsense. Let's leave him be for now. Hey, I can't just let him get away with saying crap like that. You're always the main character in your own life. I've got serious issues with what Battler's saying. 
<laughs> Jessica's like, I have a philosophical opposition to what Battler is saying. He's just half asleep. Don't take him too seriously. It's just that lack of guts. You know, not wanting to go on stage just because you think you can't be the main character. Something about it just pisses me off. <laughs> Jessica putting her brass knuckles on, bobbing and weaving. Battler, debate me! Wake up and debate me, Ushira Mia Battler! With distant eyes, Jessica gazed out the window at the gray rose garden obscured by rain. Oh, it's gray for her. When she put her forehead up against the glass, the pleasantly cool sensation seemed to chase away memories she was trying to forget. So, it just wasn't your turn yet? Is that it? Then, just when will you get up on the stage? In that case, who the heck is the main character on this stage? Let's go! Dang, it's like you think you can do whatever you want. What the hell is all this? It's all screwed up! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was merely amused that your reason for denying me was based on whether there were 18 or 19 people. I just tried changing my opening move. No more. Your greatest basis for denying me is simply that I wasn't laid out as a piece on the game board. So, all I have to do is start by focusing on the queen, like this. Isn't opening the road for the queen on your first turn one of the classic moves in chess? Are they debating mid-game? Oh, of course! <laughs> Quit playing around. There's no way I can accept something like this, right? A witch came in, walked right through the entrance hall, you say? Don't mess with me. What's this? In the last game, I gave you incredible freedom in making your moves, correct? This time, all I'm doing is moving my pieces in response to your moves. Are you already giving up right at the start? You, you bastard. Don't mess with me. Like hell I'd give in. Great move. Go ahead and just move however you like. Okay. So your turn's far from over, is it? Move however you want. Form a huge battle formation while you still can. I'll definitely withstand you. I'll definitely corner you. Come at me as best you can. I don't want you to have any excuses. You aren't even close to making me accept something like a witch. That's right. Just now, it looked like Maria's candy was fixed with magic. But you might have actually had another one of the same candy hidden in your pocket and switch them with that little show, making it only look like you fixed it with magic. Yeah, that's right. That has to be it. It's useless. It's all useless. <laughs> Rosa saw the moment when the candy split into butterflies, correct? Who cares about that? That was a hallucination or a trick, or maybe she just saw it wrong. That isn't a big problem. <laughs> so, you throw out the part you can't explain as trivial? I see. Is that your move in response to mine? <laughs> You've dug your own grave, Ushiromiya Battler. <laughs> it still isn't your turn yet. Allow me to make my move for a little longer. It has barely begun. The turn of the witch. That's the name of this book. Well, it's Turn of the Golden Witch. 